Joy Knight has graciously volunteered to be our lay reader, so please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Would you join me in the call to worship that has been adapted from Psalm 23? As God is our shepherd, we need nothing else. We are as green pastures and walk as still waters, which renews and refreshes our earth. God guides us along paths of righteousness. And walks with us through the shadow of the earth, so we are not afraid. The shepherd's staff comforts us. There we're anointed with oil and our cup overflows. Goodness and mercy shall never depart from us as long as we dwell in the house of God. steady rain outside that reminds us of the many ways in which you shower us with blessings. As individuals, we may have come this day for a variety of reasons, but let us collectively for not forget that we're here to celebrate the bounty in our lives bounty made possible by you. We thank you too for this community in which we live and worship. In this town, there are people of different cultures, colors, abilities, ages, sexual orientations, people on the left and the right, young and old, rich and poor, yet our congregation doesn't really reflect this diversity in all its richness. Help us, we pray, to find new ways of being in this community. When or if we erect walls built by our biases, by fear, by insecurity, forgive us, O oh God. Embolden us to be more curious and less guarded. To love as unconditionally as you do. Help us take down the walls that we live behind so that we might reach out to the stranger and become 
a more complete reflection of the diversity of creation itself. At the same time, we, may we also be nourished by the hidden diversity that exists here in the form of unique gifts that we each possess. Be with us today as we hear your word and sing your praise and encourage us to not only welcome strangers, but to seek them out as we seek you together. Gracious God, we welcome your presence into our lives and throughout this service as we join together saying, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Psalm 23, and I will be reading from the message. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows, and you find quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way, go, way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid. When you walk at my side, your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head, my cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. May God bless our comprehension of these sacred words. Our second reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses um, 30 through 34 and 53 through 56. The lectionary reading today completely lives, leaves out the feeding of the thousands. So if uh, you want to read this within its whole context, I encourage you to, uh, to look back and read the whole chapter later at home. For now, we meet Jesus at the height of his public ministry. And the story goes like this. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. He said them, to them, come away to a deserted place all by ourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them and they hurried there on foot from the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, they saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach, teach them in many ways. When they had crossed over, he came to the land of Genesis, Genesaret and mourned, moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into the villages and cities or farms, they laid their sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
time this morning with a much loved psalm, 23rd Psalm. Um, in the Old English, you may remember, the 23rd Psalm reads, Yea, though I walk through the I will fear no evil. See, still got it. This part of the psalm attributed to King David plainly explains that life isn't all sunshine and flowers, nor does it pretend that evil and death don't exist. No, we live in a world where bad things happen to people. Good people, bad people, people everywhere in between. The writer goes on to say that even paths of righteousness, even paths of righteousness, lead through the valley of the shadow of death. In other words, we all die. Saints, sinners, everyone we love. The psalmist doesn't try to explain or minimize evil, rather flatly states, I will not fear evil. I will not fear evil. In other words, for all the power that evil has, evil does not have power over me. Alexander Pope once wrote, hope springs eternal in the human breast. His dictum is still as profound as it is po poetic, in that hope is every heart's greatest yearning. We all hope. It is the belief that an individual believes that something good is going to come out of even the worst situation the worst circumstances. The Bible contains countless stories of hope, and today we've heard two, one in the 23rd Psalm and the other in this story about Jesus, not teaching from or healing from a lofty pulpit, but there among the people. Though written for people in different times and places, their words offer the world a message of hope. One of the things that I have always loved about this church, and it's really funny, my mother came to visit once, and she's like, it was just the energy in the church was so welcoming. And, and that's one of the first things that I... Uh, just really loved about this church is the sense of welcome and hope. There is hope, albeit be it quiet in our very New England way, there is almost a palpable sense of hope and welcome here. Having hope in a binary world and being welcoming isn't all that easy to pull off, especially when we're talking about people who have very different opinions and standards and ways of being. But we have come to a point in the life of our country that being a welcoming congregation isn't enough. Historically, mainline churches across the United States are dying in large part because there are so many things out there competing for what I fondly call our life force energy or attention. Let's face it, we live in a culture that begs the question, what's in it for me? And if the cost-benefit analysis doesn't add up just right, well then, better to go up to camp than to church on Sunday. So 
So what's in it for you? What's in it for me? I'd say for myself, coming to church is an investment in my spiritual well-being. Mm -hmm. Kind of like going to the gym regularly is an investment in your physical well-being. Going to church strengthens, stretches your muscles of hope. And I personally think we could all use a little strengthening and flexibility. Maybe that's the athletic trainer in me, but there you go. As if my subconscious knew that I'd be preaching on this today, during my week off, I had a week off, kind of, uh, I, I did some reading, and I read this book, Between Two Kingdoms. And um, it's written by a woman named Suliki Jessed, and she writes about her journey through that dark valley that often leads to death, called cancer. Sulika is her name, and she grew up in a non-religious household. But her extended family were a cross of religious and ethnically diverse believers of types. Her, her mother's family was Swiss Catholic. Her father's family was Muslim Tunisian. And so when they went to visit her mother's family at Christmas, they went to Mass. And when they went to visit uh, her father's family during Ramadan, they observed Ramadan. As a family, they didn't belong to a specific faith community. They were essentially a religious, but they did observe secular Christmas. I've heard countless parents and grandparents apologize for the fact that their kids and their grandkids don't go to worship. As if I'm the faith police or something, I don't know. But here's the thing. We've heard it said countless times, there are no atheists in foxholes. And in this chronicle, Sulika eventually has a need to reach out for something or someone greater than herself. After well over a year of treatment, which included things like blood draws and scans and x-rays and injections and chemotherapy, clinical trials with religious, uh, I'm sorry, uh, rigorous regimes of chemotherapy, family meetings, months of isolation, and searching for the right donor. Here's something that I didn't even get, but when you're looking for a bone marrow donor or a blood marrow donor, and you are of mixed ethnic background, that puts you in a very specific subset. So she had to find somebody who was Swiss and Tunisian. What are the chances, right? Fortunately, spoiler alert, in her case, her, her brother was a perfect match, but that usually doesn't even happen, even in families. But after well over a year of jumping through a lot of hoops, she came to the night before she was to have a stem cell transplant. And she needed to reach out. Not well versed in prayer, she untangled herself from her tether of IV poles and got on the floor and said, I don't want to die. There, in the foxhole of cancer, the valley of the shadow of death, 
she reached out. Like those who were reaching out to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Desperate. Hoping for healing. We all need hope and healing. Some of us more than others. Perhaps not from cancer, but our need for hope is universal. Now, I could segue into a litany of how churches think they have the patent on hope. And congregations around the globe have convinced themselves that they are clubs for those who are going to heaven and not hospitals for sinners. I could point out that in the United States, churches are still among the most segregated institutions in the land. At this very moment, when Christians around the world are saying in Christ there is no east or west, we stand mostly in segregated populations. Isn't that tragic? I think it's something we need to change. But that's a sermon about complacency and complicity for another time. This morning, I want to simply remind you that hope vanquishes fear. Hope is universal, and it possesses the ability to initiate healing. It is what propelled those people to reach out. Hope is colorblind, it's genderblind, and thanks be to God, it doesn't claim a political party. It does not care if or whom you're married to. Hope does not care how old you are, how much money you make. But all of us need it. Just ask the people who reached out to touch Jesus' garment. Okay, maybe you can't do that because they're dead. You could ask the people from ancient Israel who sought freedom from oppression, but they're dead. Or you could have a conversation with someone sitting close to you about when they needed hope and healing. Hope in the form of healing, hope in the form of financial security, hope in the form of housing or mobility or acceptance. People need hope for a life free from abuse or addiction or violence or neglect. Hope of a life beyond this one where pain and death no longer threaten. We all need hope. Not just we who are gathered here, but the world needs hope. As followers of God, a God who does not leave us in darkness, as followers of the risen Christ, who put himself out there for a world in need, it's our responsibility to claim that Claim it and exercise it, just like you're spiritually exercising right now. Exercise that hope and help make that gift of hope accessible to others. Because hope springs eternal. Amen. I hope you haven't fallen asleep. And I would invite you into a spirit of prayer. At some point in this prayer, I'm going to leave a space. And if you have a prayer that's utmost on your heart, I invite you to name it out loud. Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Gracious God, 
whose abundant mercies meet and greet us every day. Today we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. For through him you grant us forgiving grace, hope, and healing. When we resist your call to open our hearts and allow the fresh grace that you offer to enter in, when we close our eyes to the infinite possibilities that you offer through healing and reconciliation, forgive us, O oh God. When we let fear overwhelm us, forgive us, O oh God. Embolden us to be more like those in the gospel who reached out to Jesus for healing. This morning we open our lives to that healing and to whatever change you have in store for us. And we place at your feet the names of people, places, and situations that are utmost on our heart. Gracious and loving God, as the water falls gently upon the earth outside, we pray for creation itself. In places of drought and fire, famine and flood, we ask that your life-giving healing be at work. We pray for every living thing in those areas and we ask for your protection. We pray for peace in places where greed and power and violence prevail. And we celebrate, just as Pat said, the many answered prayers and the many healings that have taken place in our church family just this week. We ask that your comfort be extended to those who are grieving. Give them the peace they need. Shower them with fond memories that buoy them in times when they think they may drown. We thank you for the many loved ones in our lives and ask your continued blessings upon them. And until that day when we are reunited with you and all the company in heaven, we ask that your grace light our path as we traverse even the darkest valleys. For we ask this in Jesus' name.
each of us continue the work that Jesus started by welcoming the strangers who cross our paths, knowing that God is with us and proclaiming God's glory in all that we say and in all that we do. My friends, go in the blessing of the Most High. Amen. Thank you.